Well, hey everyone, it's Hudson. Welcome to this setup video for Nikon's retro styled but very futuristic uh, camera, the ZF. We're gonna go through, I'm gonna run through all the menus. I may not highlight every single menu option in the interest of time, but I'm gonna go through the things that I've changed in the menus uh, and highlight some cool new stuff that's available in this camera and basically run through and explain most of what's going on in the menus and settings of this, you know, deceptively high-tech, beautiful piece of equipment that Nikon's given us. I love this camera. Uh, I did a complete review of it. You can just click right up here and it'll take you to that review or you can go down in this video's full description. There's also a link to all the accessories and things that I uh, love for this camera. That's also in that review video. Um, it's, it's a ton of fun using this camera and you know, we've got a lot to cover. Thankfully this doesn't have, well, in a way, thankfully this will be a single video. Some other cameras I've done with multiple bank settings I've gone through and done multiple videos. This will all be in one video. It's going to take some time, but I'll make it as quick as I can. Uh, and I'll give you a link to my settings file for this camera. This camera is a little bit simpler than some of the other Nikon cameras that I tend not to do that with. But you know, I would really highly recommend you not just download that settings file and apply it to your camera without understanding how I've changed settings in this camera and how they all work. This is really made to be a video giving you an overview of all the settings that are important in this camera and, and let you think about whether or not each setting that I've chosen to change makes sense for your style of shooting. I don't expect you to just adopt every setting that I've done. I would think you would run through it and think whether some of those make sense or don't make sense given on your, giving your style of shooting. And we're going to move really fast over things involving flash or multiple camera scenarios or video settings. I'll, I'll touch quickly you know, where those things are in the camera, but we'll not go into a lot of depth. All right, so we'll start off in our photo shooting menu. And you navigate the menus through this, this circular little ring button around the OK. They're left, right, up, down. The OK button selects things and deselects things. And we'll also be using the I menu button, but that's basically the buttons. Oh, and the little question mark button. You'll notice that the magnification down button uh, gives you information about things. I'll show you where that becomes pertinent. But if you push the left arrow and you get into this bank of different menus, you can run through all the menus in the camera and jump into whichever one you want by pressing right. So we're gonna start at the top, the photo shooting menu. <clears throat> Resets the photo shooting menu, resets it to factory defaults. We're not gonna do that. We're talking about customizing settings. You can rename your storage folder, choose different storage folders on your memory cards here. I'm just gonna leave that at default. You can change your file naming. Uh, you go in there and literally you can go in and change the file name. Remember, this is a touch screen, so you can use it like a tap keypad. Uh, I've changed mine to be Nikon ZF so that I can differentiate files shot with this in their raw format from other cameras. Primary slot, I choose the SD card slot. It's faster than the micro SD card slot. That's my primary slot. Secondary slot function, I use as overflow. I am using a very fast micro SD card from Lexar, and I use that to store my video files and time-lapse uh, video files. Uh, I use overflow, not back. Backup would store every image shot on both cards, and then you would be limited to the speed of the slower card, which would be the micro SD slot. I've been pretty blown away that these Lexar Gold micro SD cards allow me to shoot in 10-bit 4K video at the highest settings with this camera. Um, but, you know, so I'm impressed with the micro SD, but it's still slower than the straight up SD if you have a good SD card. Image area, that's are you shooting full frame or DX or a square or, or 16 by nine. Uh, and I like to leave that in full frame and have the DX crop alert active so that if you do switch to DX, it's gonna alert you. You'll know, you get a little red blinking light that it's in DX mode on the LCD or in the viewfinder. Tone mode, SDR versus uh, hyperlog gamut. I, I really am gonna recommend everybody use SDR, even if you have an HDR monitor. You know, this is such new tech, standards are shifting all the time. Most people don't have an HDR monitor. If you're shooting in hyperlog gamut and editing in hyperlog gamut, and then sending it off to people who don't have HDR monitors, the image may not look like you intend when other people are looking at it. Um, I, I just stay in an SDR world for now until things shake out with HDR monitors and viewing. 
You know, I think this is some future tech that Nikon's gambling goes one direction, but who knows? It's sort of like beta and VHS. Stick, stick with the standard right now. I stick with standard dynamic range, SDR. Image quality, raw. You know, you can go in and choose different JPEGs or raw plus JPEGs. This camera does a beautiful job with raw files. It puts the profile with the raw file so that in Lightroom you'll see it in the profile that you chose. And that's in that picture control settings. We'll talk about that in a minute. Image size settings, that's just for JPEGs. Raw recording, what level of compression? I like the lowest level of compression possible, the highest quality raw image possible. Yes, it's a little bit bigger, but it's all about quality for me. Let's get the highest quality we can get out of our camera. ISO sensitivity settings, that's where you turn ISO settings. You know, That's on the dial up here. I also program a button. We'll talk about that in custom controls. Uh, but you can turn auto ISO on and off in here, and if it's on, you can set a maximum sensitivity. Again, with this amazing low light sensor, I choose 25,600. I know I'll get a great result after I do some denoise work, say, in Lightroom. White balance, you can choose your white balance. I generally run auto or natural light auto uh, for shooting stills and outdoor conditions like I normally have, but sometimes I choose you know, either a preset or a Kelvin color temperature or cloudy or sunlight. Uh, set picture control. This is where you're choosing what, you know, what, what, what picture would the JPEG, what settings would the JPEG be created with? Do you want a vivid JPEG or a standard or, you know, black and white? And I choose neutral and there's a reason for that. Even though I'm shooting raw, the little preview image when you hit play has to be generated from that raw data and it's generated as a JPEG using these settings. And the neutral view is, is, a little bit of a compromise. Flat would give you the best representation of your raw file, but neutral still has a nice look, is closer to where you want it to go when you're editing, and yet doesn't boost the contrast to give you false views of how bright and dark the image is. It gives you a good representation of your raw data. And the histogram that's built, that you're looking at in the camera to judge your exposure, is based off of the setting, off the JPEG that's created. And I find neutral's pretty close to the raw files histogram. So I just use neutral. The other thing that's important is you should experiment with these three different monochrome profiles that they put in the ZF. Flat is a real low contrast black and white. Deep tone is a real high contrast black and white. Monochrome is kind of a, a, a split between the two. Whichever one you were in last, when you flip that lever to black and white, you can go from video to stills to black and white. It's going to go with whichever of these profiles was last active. I like monochrome, so I'd experiment with all three and then make sure that that was the one that was selected last so that when you flip to black and white, you're going to, you're going to go to the profile that is important to you. You can customize these, these profiles and create your own profiles and manage picture control. We won't go into that. Set picture control for hyperlog gamut shooting. We're not going to go there. We're talking about shooting in standard dynamic range. Remember, hyperlog gamut's just a little too experimental for me. Color space, I choose Adobe RGB. And if I ever shoot a JPEG, which is rare, I just want it to be captured in a wider color space to be able to edit it more. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just my choice. Some people shoot in sRGB. That's the language of the web. That's instantly shareable in its native state. But I generally compress and make files smaller before I share them across the internet anyway. So if I capture a big full resolution raw or JPEG, I want to be able to edit it. Active D lighting, this is going to be applied to JPEGs. Uh, this just boosts shadow detail a little bit in the JPEG. I leave it at normal. You can experiment with it if you're shooting JPEGs. Long exposure noise reduction, that just gets rid of dead pixels. It causes your image to take twice as long to capture when you're doing long exposures. Uh, it's something that you might want to turn off if you're doing time lapse, that kind of thing. But I, I turn it on for doing really you know, high quality night work and low light work and long exposure work. It just makes it easier. You, if you've got dead pixels and anomalies on the sensor, given the humidity and temperature and use, it, it creates a second it capture with a dark slide and compares the two and removes anomalies and it does a really great job of that. High ISO noise reduction, again that's going to be for JPEGs. Normal just reduces noise a little bit in your image. Um, you know, I leave it at normal. I never turn it off. Vignette control, these are all again JPEG settings. It's going to going to do a little vignette removal if the lens has a profile. If the lens has a profile, it's going to apply it in Lightroom as well. 
diffraction to the raw file. Diffraction compensation removes you know some of the softening that happens at really high apertures with lenses. Um, auto distortion control again sort of gets rid of keystoning things like that. I leave that turned on. Skin softening and portrait impression balance. That's something that portrait photographers might want to experiment with, but it kind of softens the image. I, I'd rather do that in post-production personally. Photo flicker reduction, that kind of times the shot for flickering lights. It, it messes with your ability to capture the moment at exactly the time you want. Something to play with if you're shooting in bad conditions and you're having a hard time getting quality images, the light's differential. Um, you could play around with that in certain L L LED lighting conditions. I generally leave it off though. Metering, you can choose between center weighted spot, highlight weighted. I generally run in, in matrix metering. Flash control, that's for off camera flash. If you have the right flash attached here, that'll light up and it control control other flashes. Um, I generally leave my flash mode in rear curtain sync so that at long exposures, it fires the flash right before closing the shutter. Um, I build in a little flash compensation. That's personal taste. I find that if I'm doing through the lens metering with a Nikon capable flash on the hot shoe, I like it turned down a little bit from what Nikon thinks. Release mode. Single frame, continuous high, continuous low, 30 frame per second JPEG mode. Those, those choices are all there, self-timer. I'm gonna put that in the I menu. This camera not having user modes and not having banks, it's really important how you load the I menu and how you load the My menu, the My menu and the I menu. We'll talk about that when we get into customization and the custom settings menu. Focusing mode, autofocus continuous, continually tracks your subject versus single servo where it locks on a static subject. Um, I generally am in continuous, but we'll talk about that. Autofocus area mode, I love this area mode, something special to the ZF. It's only available in the Nikon ZF at this moment, it's release, and the Z8 and the Z9, and it lets you move a point around the frame and say, that is my subject, and then it'll look for that subject's eyes, face, head, headlights for a car, you know, the front end of an airplane or a car. It, it has subject detection and a point that you're pointing out. This person, not the other person on the other side. Love the 3D tracking, and I live in that mode mostly. Autofocus, manual focus, subject detection options. So this thing also sees subjects when you're using manual focus, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for both of them, you know, auto, would it will look for people before it looks for animals, before it looks for vehicles, before it looks for airplanes. If you know what you're shooting, you can select that thing and it makes it a little bit more accurate. Um, but auto's pretty good if you're just out running around and you might shoot a person or a car or, or an animal. Um, manual focus subject detection area. So this is crazy. When you're in manual focus, with a manual focus lens or just turning an autofocus lens off, it'll still see subjects. And you can choose whether you want to look for subjects in a wide area, large, wide area, small, or just auto area, the whole frame of the camera. I like wide area, large. It lets me say, this is the person that's in, that I'm interested in. And then suddenly you'll see their face or their eye light up with a box around it. And you can manually focus till that box goes green. And if you hit the OK button and you programmed it like I do this camera, when we go into custom settings, it'll zoom to 100% and track that eye or that face around the frame while you perfect focus. Um, it's crazy. It really changes manual focus, makes it way more accurate. And it makes a lens like this 51.0 f1.0 Voigtlander manual focus lens just an incredible tool on this camera. And it's the only camera in the world I know that can do that. Uh, hopefully other cameras from Nikon do that and other brands get the idea and do that too because it's really, really cool. Vibration reduction, is it on? Is it in sport mode or normal mode? Normal mode, it does just intense in-body image stabilization. Even without a vibration reduction lens, you can get to eight stops of image stabilization. But sometimes as you shoot the shutter, you'll see your camera kind of jerk away from where it was. As it's locked on, doing its vibration reduction, sometimes the sensor moves a bit from where you've composed and you'll see the image shift around a little bit. I've heard people complain about that. If you're shooting sports and things are moving fast and you can't have that happening, you can go into sport mode and it's maybe a little less accurate, but it, it won't change your view as it's working. You'll see what I mean if you play around with it in both modes, especially the long lens, just experiment with it. Link vibration reduction to the focus point. This is another Nikon first. So most 
image stabilization systems work on the center of the sensor. That's where it's positioned and focused to work at its absolute best as the center focus point. This camera allows you to key that vibration reduction out to the outer edges of the sensor when using different focus points out around the edge. So it literally is focused on the focus point, making sure the image stabilization is maximized in that area of the sensor. Super cool. And I have shot waterfalls with this camera handheld up to 75 millimeters at a half a second and had everything but the water sharp. It's nuts. It works really, really well. This is the best image stabilization that I've ever used. So auto bracketing, this is where you can turn bracketing on and off, choose how many frames you're capturing, choose how many stops apart each frame are. The capability of doing this, even handheld in burst mode, makes graduated filters an archaic thing of the past that puts a, an artificial contrast line through your image. With the settings that I use here, turning bracketing on, shooting three frames, three stops apart, so it shoots on the light meter, shoots three frames overexposed, three stops overexposed, three same stops underexposed, and blending those in post-production to get one high dynamic range file with all that exposure latitude. It's like putting a six stop graduated filter everywhere in your frame at the same time um, and with no artificial contrast line. You're just able to pull the shadows from one area and compress the highlights from another area anywhere in the frame. I use this all the time and I put it in the eye menu. I'll show you how I make easy access to this. Multiple exposure. This can be kind of fun. You can have it do this overlay mode as many, many different exposures, two, three, four, and you can keep capturing and overlaying the images over the top of each other in different blend modes. It's kind of fun to play with. I don't use it very often. It creates a JPEG of the multiple exposure. It also lets you save the raw files if you want individually at the same time because you can obviously do this in post-production too with layered apps like Photoshop or on one. So you can read about it. Any of these menu options that have a question mark in the top right, you can touch that question mark or you can hit that minus magnification button that has a question mark printed to the side of it and it'll give you information about it, which is pretty cool. So if you have questions about a menu option and it has a question mark, it'll, the camera has a built-in user manual for that mode. Pretty cool stuff. HDR overlay, that's in-camera HDR. I just don't mess with it. I would rather shoot bracketed and do much more controlled HDR blending in post-production in Lightroom um, or in on one. Interval timer shooting, this is how I shoot time-lapse and shooting a whole series of raw files. You can go in and you can tell it you know, a start time if you want it to remote start, what the interval between each frame is, how many frames you want to capture. There's a lot of other settings in here. Um, exposure smoothing, you can read about that. That's only if you're using a non-manual mode or auto ISO. It'll try to make it really smooth transitions between exposure changes. Um, I turn the electronic shutter on so that it's not actually using the shutter for all those captures. Um, the focus before each shot, I always leave turned off. Interval priority, I, I leave turned off. Under options, you can have it create a time-lapse video, and you can say, I want that sent to the micro SD card. As I said, I put all my video output to the micro SD card. So it, in effect, will create a time-lapse video from all of those stills that you captured and capture all of the stills. And you can also put those all in a, um, you can put them all in a different starting storage folder so that when you hit start on this, after you've got all your settings set up, it's gonna create a new folder on your memory card and put that whole time-lapse sequence in that folder so you can import it separately from the rest of your images. That's a great, great feature. Time-lapse video, that's in-camera time-lapse video capture. It doesn't save you any raw files. It's really not very editable after the fact. It gives you very little control. You can create some fun stuff. You can play around with it. It's got a lot of the same settings, um, but you'll not create nearly as high a quality and output with the in-camera time-lapse video. It's fun to play with if you want. Focus shift shooting. I have a manual focus lens on here, but focus shift shooting allows you to focus to the closest thing in your scene, set some parameters, and have it capture differentially focused images to capture everything in the frame and focus. Um, it, it's a really cool feature. I should probably do a video about it pretty soon. It's, it's, it's really quite incredible for doing focus stacking. It's automated focus stacking capture, essentially. Pixel shift shooting. This is a new thing with the ZF. You can go in here and you can tell it you want to 
capture just the next frame or a whole series of frames every time you hit the shutter button. You want it to be a pixel shift capture. And you can tell it how many frames you want to capture. If you shoot four or eight frames, all it does is it captures every single different color um, on each of the pixels, red, green, and blue at each pixel receptor site instead of only one and blending those all. So you get a better quality image. And then if you, that's if you shoot four, if you shoot eight, it'll also do some, some, some stacking where it's gonna remove noise and just give you a higher quality image by, by analyzing all of the frames at all of the different colors. It gives you a higher quality output. If you go 16, it does all the color sampling at each pixel site and creates a 96 megapixel file instead of a 24 megapixel file. It triples the resolution by shifting the, the sensor around as it captures. Similar in output quality, I'm finding to a five or six frame multi-row panorama. Um, pretty darn amazing. If you do 32, it does that stacking thing to reduce noise and increase image quality. So the highest possible quality is with 32 frames. It takes longer um, and you really don't want any motion to be happening in your scene. So this isn't gonna be good with blowing leaves or a waterfall flowing through your scene. It's more for static landscape scenes or static still lifes, but it really does create a high quality, amazing output. And I'll do a whole video about that soon, about how to set up to capture it, things to think about while capturing. You gotta be on a tripod, obviously, and then how to put those together in post. It's pretty darn cool. And that pretty much concludes our photo shooting menu. We go into video and I'm gonna run over this really, really quick. Same thing with storage folder and file naming. Destination, I put to the micro SD card. Video file type, I like the H.265 10-bit, but that's partly because I do a little bit of color grading in post and it gets me a higher dynamic range image, a little bit more image quality. If you're not wanting to do much post-production, you go to 8-bit H.265, great quality as well. Um, when it comes to the frame size and frame rate, I wanna shoot it uh, at 4K, 24 frames a second. That's cinematic to me. 30 frames a second is more broadcast television look. Um, the 3840 by 2160, that's just 4K. Um, you can shoot at 1080, lower quality, and you can shoot up to you know, 120 frames per second at 1080. Um, you can shoot it up at 60 frames a second. That's just for, for smoother capture of fast motion or to slow things down. Um, a little, you know, the 120 frames per second at 1080 is five times slow motion if you play it back at 120 frames, if you slow that down to 24 frames per second playback, it slows everything down. Again, just general video, 2160, 24. Uh, image area, are you shooting a DX crop? Are you shooting an FX crop? You can shoot 4K in the DX crop, it's pretty cool. Um, ISO sensitivity settings, same as we were doing in uh, stills, except I never use auto ISO with video. I don't want exposure changing around. White balance, uh, in general, I shoot, I pick a white balance when I'm shooting video. Um, I don't usually use auto just in case it makes changes in the middle of the video, which look weird uh, as it's changing during video. Picture control, again, I shoot neutral. Um, neutral looks great with the video. For me, it's, I still am gonna color tweak it a little bit. If you don't wanna do any tweaking whatsoever, you might try standard. Just experiment a little bit. Um, again, you can set up your own custom profiles. Hyperlog gamut quality, that's if you're shooting in a, again, high dynamic range hyperlog gamut, or um, you can also do Nikon N-Log. I wouldn't you know, recommend that unless, it, you're, you're probably not needing to watch this video if you're shooting in hyperlog gamut or N-Log. Active D lighting, again, that just boosts shadows a little bit. I leave it at normal, you can experiment with it. High ISO noise reduction, I leave it normal. Vignette control and diffraction compensation and auto distortion control, I leave on. Skin softening portrait impression, just like stills, I leave that off. If close-ups of people's faces are your thing, you might experiment with it. Video flicker reduction, this is a little bit different. It has an auto mode. Uh, and, and it's automatically gonna look for flickering lights that would really be bothersome in video and try to tune itself to avoiding that being a problem. The camera does a great job choosing. Metering, I stick with matrix. Focusing mode, it adds a new focusing mode, not just AFS and AFC, you get AFF, which is full-time autofocus. So whatever area mode you choose, without touching a button, it'll consistently and constantly be focusing. You can tell it what the subject is with different modes, like 
you know, some of the some of the subject tracking, some of those things. But it's just going to constantly keep auto focusing without you touching a button, and that's what I generally use with video. You've got auto area mode, you've got a subject tracking mode, you've got those wide area modes where you can use the touch screen if you want and set up what you're focused on and have it automatically focusing. Manual focus is also great with video, and we have manual focus and auto focus subject detection options just like we have with stills. You know, you can leave that on auto or choose whether it's people, animal, airplanes, what have you. And it also has the option to continue focusing in that automatic focus, the AFF mode, even when no subject's detected. And what it's going to do is it's going to do closest subject priority. So it's going to pick the closest thing that could be a subject in the frame and keep that focused, even if it doesn't find an identifiable human or animal or, or, or car or plane or anything like that. It's pretty cool. You get a lot of the power of the Z8 and the Z9 in here. Uh, and in, 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 it's the first camera to bring that that's not one of them. Manual focus subject detection area, just like we have with stills. I like wide area large, but you can do the whole frame or wide area small, and it will recognize subjects and let you manually focus and automatically zoom in on the eye and all that fun stuff that is a Nikon and maybe other camera world first to my knowledge. Vibration reduction, I leave on. Electronic vibration reduction, that's another one. Hit the OK button, turn on and off. Um, I leave it turned off, but it's kind of like GoPro and some of these drones use, they, they crop in on the sensor and actually move what they're capturing on the sensor around to adjust for vibration that's happening. It's just another level of vibration reduction beyond the physical system built into the sensor, an electronic version. And if you're having a situation where it's really hard to keep it still and you really need it locked down, you can turn that on and even more augment the vibration reduction in video mode. I don't find I need it very often, even shooting with the 100 to 400 or the 800 PF. In video mode, I've gotten pretty nice, stable stuff, braced a little bit, handheld, um, but it's there if you need it. And I put that in the iMenu for video. I'll show you how to do that. Microphone sensitivity. Um, I use external mics. I leave it set at level three or four, but you can go into automatic if you want. Um, attenuator, that just accentuates the signal. Frequency response is wide or vocal. Uh, why does to capture the sound of waves rolling on the beach? I was doing that in Scotland last. You know, I mean, it'll capture it'll it'll capture the whole world around it. Whereas vocal range kind of narrows what it's looking for down to voices. If you're doing interviews and things like that, wind noise reduction. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the onboard microphones in Nikon or the onboard amplifiers even for external microphones. I try to do that outside the Nikon app and feed in a nice clean signal via external mics when I possibly can. But if you have to use the internal, you can play around with these settings. Is the microphone jack providing power for phantom power required mics? Um, what's the headphone volume for listening and monitoring what you're hearing in the microphone? Time code is for synchronizing bigger projects like films that have multiple cameras and multiple audio sources. I wouldn't, I'm not going to go into that. Same thing with external recording control via HDMI. That's more Hollywood type stuff. We go into our custom settings menu. You know, I went to the left, down to the pencil icon, and each one of these is a whole different section in the menu. You see how it's in an arrow to the right? You go into the A settings, you can go into the B settings. It's just a shortcut because these are deep, and this is where we'll spend the bulk of our time in this video. And I'll go as fast as I can because this is, this is getting lengthy already and we've got a lot more to cover. So autofocus continuous priority selection. This is when you're tracking subjects and I'm setting it so that release is what's most important to me, not focus when I'm shooting action and motion. I want to capture that decisive moment. When I'm shooting in single servo autofocus mode where it's locking focus on subjects, focus is more important to me. You know, I'm shooting a landscape. I want to be razor sharp and in focus more than I want to capture that decisive moment with action, things moving. Focus tracking with lock on. Uh, you know, this is all, I leave it in the default setting. It's about how long does it, does it wait before it leaves a subject when, say, it goes behind a tree and it's going to come out the other side. I find the base mode is good. You can adjust it a little bit for when your subject's interrupted by something coming in between you and it. Focus points used. Do you want to use all the focus points? There are tons of them. Or do you want to just use half of them? I use them all. Store points by orientation. This is about 
flipping from vertical to horizontal. You know, if you were shooting horizontal and you had your focus point set and you wanted to capture it in vertical and you move your focus point down to be set, when you flip it back, does it remember where you were before? I like it too. You've also got an option to remember the autofocus area mode that you were in separately for the two. I never do that. That seems confusing to me. I'm sure there's a use case for it. I just haven't encountered it. I like simply the focus point. Uh, or you can turn that whole thing off and just have it not change based on, on position of the camera. Autofocus activation. This is where you go to back button autofocus. And I highly recommend if you're focusing using the shutter button, think about unlearning that bad habit. The focus button or the, the shutter button is for tripping the shutter. For me, that button back here, it's marked on the ZF as A-E-L-A-F-L. That is for focusing. You use your thumb to focus. You can position the point and focus and hold your focus and shoot. And you let off the focus, it's not focusing at all. You can reposition and shoot to your heart's content. It doesn't start focusing again until you hit that button. I don't want it to refocus every time I choose to hit the shutter. They seem like disconnected functions to me. So there you go. That's my pitch for back button focus. A6 is where you set it. It should say off for back button focus. Focus point persistence. That's, you know, I, I'm not even going to go into that. Limit AF area mode selection. You can turn off different area modes that you don't want to use. I don't really use dynamic area at all, so I have those turned off. If you're using a button to access them, it just won't be in the rotation. Focus point wraparound. I leave this turned off. This is like Pac-Man going through the tunnel from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. Or if you're hunting for letters in the alphabet on your TV using a remote control, you can go off the right side and come up on the left side. For me... I don't like that with focus point. The focus point moves around fast, and if it jumps off the right and comes up to the left, it throws me off to have to come back to the left to get it back where I wanted it. Some people love it. I really don't like it. Focus point display. You can change some ways about, you know, does the focus point pop up in manual focus mode? I want it to. Does it give you some help when you're in uh, autofocus continuous or dynamic area? What color is the 3D tracking point? I like red. Um, so you get the idea. Just some changes, ways to customize that. Built-in AF Assist Illuminator, that's that green light you constantly see flashing on cameras in dark situations. Green on Nikon, at least. I turn that bugger off. Um, I would only turn it on if I really needed it, you know, in an event shooting scenario, maybe. I find it really annoying in general. Focus peaking. Here's where you can turn it on and off, um, and you can set your sensitivity. Now, I'm going to put this in the My Menu, and I'll talk about what goes in the My Menu and the I Menu for easy access, because this is something I turn on and off whether I want it or not. Sometimes I find it distracting, sometimes I find it really helpful. Um, you can choose how sensitive is the focus peaking. I generally like the standard, and what color is it? I like red. Um, focus point selection speed. You can make it fast, but this camera has such a fast processor, I find the point races around too quickly for me to keep up with. Um, I actually like normal just for moving the point around with the pad when I'm selecting what point I want to be using. ISO sensitivity step value. We've gotten into metering and exposure. We got through the autofocus settings, which were long, so that's good. Um, ISO sensitivity step value. I just like to leave it at a third. You can change that to a, a full step if you want to move quickly through exposure. Um, easy exposure compensation. Um, that's weird. This thing has a dial for exposure compensation. I suppose you could program the custom button to be exposure compensation, and then what this means is you press the button, and then you turn the command dial, and it changes it uh, without having to hold the button down. It seems like it's like a leftover in this camera's menu that doesn't belong there to me. But Matrix metering face detection. This, you can turn on and off with the OK button. This essentially says take into account faces and meter with an extra extra uh, emphasis on getting the faces properly exposed if people are in your scene. That makes sense to me. Unless you're shooting a silhouette, um, in which case, you know, you want that black, human, beautiful sky. In that case, you're going to have to think about using a different metering mode, maybe. Um, center-weighted metering. You've got ways to customize the center-weighted. I never really use center-weighted. I use spot or matrix, so you can change that if you want right there. Fine-tune optimal exposure. This is if you find that for you, the camera's overexposing things. I find Nikon's exposure is great. I don't mess with this, but you could dial in a little permanent exposure compensation here if you wanted to. It'll give you all kinds of warnings on the way to doing it. 
Shutter release button. We're into timers and auto exposure lock. Shutter release button locks exposure. So if you hold it halfway down like you would with locking autofocus if it were on the shutter button, which I don't recommend, you can also have it lock exposure as you recompose. I don't ever do that. That's where you would turn it on if you wanted to. Self timer, you can tell it what delay do you want, how many shots do you want it to take, how long between each shot when you put it in self timer mode, which is in the drive modes again. Power off delay. I have these set really long right now. I would stick with the factory default to save battery. I only have it because I'm making this video right now and I don't want it constantly timing out on me. Uh, continuous low speed, what, how many frames per second is that? You can really adjust that to whatever you want right here. Maximum shots per burst when you're in burst mode, high speed, continuous, low speed, continuous, high speed, extended. How many frames are the maximum that you can capture without lifting and shooting again? I put it at the maximum 200. Pre-release capture options. So this is in that C30 mode where you're capturing 30 frames per second JPEGs. Um, and you can actually set it so that if you hold the shutter button down halfway, it's actually recording a series of JPEGs over the top of themselves on the card, constantly recording. And yet it's not saving them unless you press the shutter button. How long in advance of you pressing the shutter button does it save? That's the pre-release burst. You can turn it off so it's not active, or you can put it a third of a second, a half a second, or a whole second before you push the button. So this is for getting that shot where the ball is coming right off the bat, or the snake opened its mouth and its tongue whipped out and came back. Too quick for you to capture, but if you were holding the button halfway down and you hit the button right after it does it, and you set it for a second, it captured the whole second beforehand at 30 frames per second. And then you can capture, how long does it capture after I push the button? Well, after you hold, holding, start, press the button, does it just continue shooting as long as it possibly can before the buffer fills? That's max. Or does it do three seconds or two seconds or one seconds of frames? That's a choice you have too. Depending on the situation, you might want to change that. I just set it at max. So that's something in there to keep in mind and maybe put in your mind menu to use really easily without delving into the custom settings menus. Sync release mode options. That's for if you're controlling multiple cameras from yours. We won't go there. Shutter type. I leave it on automatic. It has both a wonderful sounding mechanical shutter as well as the ability to do electronic front curtain shutter when it makes the most sense. Let the camera choose. It does a great job. Extended shutter speeds. Uh, this is where turning this on, which I recommend, I don't know why it's not on but by default, takes you to, to, to programmed shutter times slower than 30 seconds. If you turn this off, 30 seconds and then bulb. You do, you know, 30 seconds is the max you can put in there. If you turn it on, you can go all the way to 900 seconds when you push the shutter button and walk away. Great for long exposure stuff. It's so cool. Limit the selectable image area. Do you never shoot with one to one or 16 by nine? You can make those so they disappear from the list when you're choosing. I don't know. Doesn't seem like that onerous to have those there. File number sequence on means that it just continues from where it last was as it creates a new folder or you clear the card. I just leave it on. I rename my files anyway when I import them. If you turn that off, it'll every time it creates a new folder or you clear the card, it'll start over at one. Um, view mode. This one throws a lot of people for a loop. This is an important one. Um, people look at this as they're running through the menus and they say, ooh, adjust for ease of viewing. That sounds nice. And they turn that on and then they say, why am I not seeing, images look perfectly exposed but I shoot and they're underexposed. Well, it's keeping it nice and bright for you to compose easily in darker situations, even if you're underexposed. So showing the effects of the settings shows you whether it's properly exposed. If it looks dark, it's because your settings are dark. If it looks too bright, it's because your settings are too bright. Always leave the show effects of settings turned on. Now there might be reasons when you're working with flash that you don't want that. You can choose always or only when flash is not used. But that's a really important one. People get in trouble with adjust for ease of viewing. Starlight view. Starlight view does this slow down low light amplification for night shooting. It's amazing. In the Milky Way scenes that I've shot with starlight view in my Z9 and Z8, you can actually compose. You can see the horizon line as it breaks into the sky and the stars. If you move the camera, everything goes wonky. You get this acid trip, tracers going everywhere. It's crazy until it settles down again. This is for the tripod, very slow movements. You can actually compose in the dark 
using this mode. It's not great for just general daylight shooting, obviously, but amazing in the dark. These are settings that we're gonna put in the My Menu so that you can access them easily for Milky Way shoots. Same thing with warm display colors. Side by side for good reason, D10, D11. Warm display colors turns every setting on this back panel and in the LCD red. And that way it doesn't blow your night vision changing settings. Everything's like a red outline. It's like a, a night mode to protect your night vision. Everything's just red. Even image display if you want. Um, view all in continuous mode. Uh, that's for shooting burst mode. Do you want to have blackout between the frames? I don't think so. So don't turn that off. If you turn it off, you'll get blackout between the frames. If you have it turned on and you want to know what's happening, even though you're getting a steady feed of what the images look like as you shoot a burst mode, it looks like you're looking at video even though you're shooting the burst mode, you can have it do different things to indicate it's shooting to you. And I like type B, which is little lines flash it all the way around the frame, like tap, 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 you get a little flashing happening around the frame while you're shooting. Type A means the screen goes dark. It's like blackout, let's not do that. And type C is it's only on the left and right side. I do type B, it gives me a good indicator. There's a little flashing box around the frame as it shoots. Image frame, I like to see the image frame. You leave that on. Grid type, I like a three by three rule of thirds grid. Virtual horizon type, you've got the two different types. Type A is what I love. It's like the pilot's gimbal sort of style. Type B is the old school that we had in the DSLR kind of outline. I like type A. All right, so next we got custom monitor shooting display and custom viewfinder dis shooting display. And these let you customize the view that you're using as you shoot. So you can turn this display is on and off, so you can have up to five of them. I only have four active for my monitor shooting, and you can set what's inside them. So you can go in and activate, you know, do you want simple details or not? Do you want more details or not? Do you want the touchscreen controls or not? Do you want the virtual horizon or not? So you get the idea. Um, for mine, I have a very simple nothing view, which is really handy. I have, and this is when you hit the display button to switch between these views. I have one where I have the histogram and the level and touchscreen controls. I have one where I have all the information. And then this display five is sort of unchangeable. This is sort of like a, uh, the, 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 the iMenu plus exposure settings just viewed on the back of the camera. This is really nice on the tripod sometimes. Um, so that's my custom monitor shooting displays. Viewfinder is really the same thing, same controls. You go in and you can turn things on and off. For me, I only have three of them. I have no information at all. I have, it's very similar, histogram and level with the grid and all my, my information, shooting information and camera settings on display three. So let's go into bracketing and flash. We're gonna go really, really quickly. Flash sync speed, the fastest you can do full power flash is one 200th of a second with the shutter in this camera. You can go up to these auto FP where it goes above 200th of a second, but to me, that really reduces your flash output power when you do that. I just leave it at 200th of a second. That's, my, that's your flash sync speed. Flash shutter speed, I said the 30th of a second, all right? and that doesn't allow you to shoot at lower shutter speeds than a 30th of a second. There might be scenarios where you want far less than that. You go down to 30 seconds if you need. Just remember that that's there. I generally, when I think about shooting with flash, and this is only going to be active in aperture priority or shutter priority mode, not or program mode, not in manual. This is not applied in manual mode. So, I you know when I think flash, I generally shoot in manual mode. I want to control all my settings. But if you happen to be in one of those auto speeds and you can't get below a thirtieth or a sixtieth of a second, this is the setting that's limiting that for you. It's making sure that your background isn't blurred from camera shake, even though the flash is instantly lighting your subject. Exposure compensation for flash. You can jump in here and decide whether that's gonna be based on the entire frame of the background only. I have entire frame right now, but I could see situations where you might change that. Um, auto ISO sensitivity control for flash. I have it really do auto ISO based only on the subject. Modeling flash off or on. It can light up the subject a little bit just to kind of get Get, get it figured out how it's gonna look. I turn that off. I don't think it works particularly well with strobe, with, with speed light strobes. Auto bracketing, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the bracketing. What is it bracketing with? Well, you know, if you're shooting with flash, 
it can bracket the flash. If you're not shooting with flash, it's shutter speed. So I generally limit it to that. You can also just have it be flash speed and then aperture or just flash and aperture. I don't really want it changing aperture. I want it to bracket with shutter speed. So shutter speed, that's what I'm doing, flash and shutter speed. Bracketing order. This is another one where people get in trouble. It, it seems like it would make sense to have the underexposed frame go first, then the metered frame, then the overexposed frame when you're bracketing images. But Nikon does this in a very strange way, where if you choose that, you need to set the first frame to be way underexposed, and then it's going to base it off that. It's not like you set what the metered frame would be, <laughs> and then it goes, it shoots under and then on the meter and then over. No, you have to set what the underexposed frame would be to fire it first. It, it really makes no sense. I wish they would change that, but it's been that way for a really long time. It's best to leave it where it just shoots on the meter and then an underexposed frame and an overexposed frame. And that way you're dialing in what the metered shot should be. Um, people get in trouble with the other. Flash burst priority. You know, it, it I would say prioritize precise flash control, but you know, some people might want the frame advance rate if you're shooting in bursts. All right, and now we get to customize the, the controls. So this is a little bit of a longer section. I'll try to move through it as quick as I can, but it's really important with this camera because it's gonna let us, say, customize the eye menu in a way that we can get all the settings from the menu that we wanna access all the time really easily just by pressing this eye button. So if I go to the right, it shows me how I've set up my eye menu. And I'll run through what I've chosen, but to change each item, you literally just push the OK button when you're hovered over it, and you can choose what you want that slot on the eye menu to be from this huge list of potential stuff. All right, I'm gonna go back, because what I wanna keep, oop, I wanted white balance. Eh, see, I just changed it. And it's gonna take you a little time to set this up because you have to find exactly what you were after, white balance. So my eye menu on the top row is white balance, metering, turning bracketing on and off and changing the settings, interval timer shooting, silent mode so that it flips it to electronic shutter no matter what if I want to be quiet and stealthy about my shooting and not make noise, autofocus and manual focus mode, whether it's AFC, AFS, or manual focus. And then the bottom row is picture control. I can change my picture control settings Got vibration reduction if I wanted to turn that off for some reason or go from sport to normal, normal to sport. Long exposure noise reduction. As I said, there's times where I don't want that. Say I'm capturing time lapse with a long exposure. I don't want it to be doubling the exposure time. It can really mess with your time lapse capture. Or there's times where I'm ranging in and just getting focus and composition at night and I don't want to be doing long exposure and doubling my exposure time for every frame until I'm ready to capture the final image and I turn it on for that, for that shot when I know I've got what I want. Focus shift shooting, that's that focus stacking capture. What release mode? Am I in high speed continuous, low speed continuous, single frame? 30 frame per second with pre-release capture or timer mode. And then what is my subject detection mode as well as what autofocus area mode am I in? And the way this works, you know, if I press my eye menu and I go into that, this is really cool because it lets me set both. I, at the top, I've got, you know, auto area, 3D tracking, wide area, customs. So I say I'm in 3D, I could go into there, then I can go down and I can choose what type of subject am I after. This is how I do it on, I use the eye menu for focus area and subject detection on the Z8, the Z9, the ZF, all, all of my cameras. So you can see how all of that works. Really nice and simple. They're all touch too. You can just jump in here and say, I want to go to autofocus continuous, although that's not going to work with a manual focus lens. So there you go. That's how we set that up. That's how I set mine up, okay? Then we go into custom controls. And I've done a few things here. You only get one function button with the ZF, and you can see where it is right here. It's showing you that it's on the front side of the camera, that yellow dot. As I move around, it'll show you where each one is on the camera with the little diagram to the left. So I have bracketing burst. What is bracketing burst? Bracketing burst means that if I turn bracketing on and I hold my custom button down with my ring finger as I hit the shutter button, it'll fire all three frames or all five frames, depending on how many frames I've chosen for bracketing, it fires it as a burst if I'm holding that button. So I don't have to worry about switching into continuous high-speed capture to capture a bracketed burst. I just push that button and hit the shutter, bap, 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 
shoot them all at once. I leave that on my bracket, um, on my custom button, because I use that all the time in high contrast situations. I have the AEL AFL for AF on, and again, back button focus. Now that becomes my focus button. And I switch. I like having the play button down here. I don't know why the ZF shifted to putting the display button there and the play button up here. It seems like something that we got over uh, when, they, when they went to the Z8 and the Z9, some of the other cameras. But here comes this camera, and they put it up there where if I'm working with a long lens, I have to reach back to the back of the camera to hit it instead of just being able to hit it with my thumb that's loose on the back of the camera. So I just switch it. I switch display and play. So I put display on the play button up here, and I put play on the display button back here. When I put my settings file out, I'm not going to do that because it'll just confuse people. But if you want, you can program this display button to be play and the play button to be display, and it makes more sense. It's what I think Nikon should have done. Um, and I don't change anything else really. Well, I do. I do, actually. Um, I, I change the OK button to be a zoom. And when I do that zoom, all right, I have it. I, I choose zoom, and I choose zoom to be 100%. You can choose 50% or 200%, 100%. That's what enables it when I want to zoom in and check critical focus. I hit the OK button, and it zooms in on my focus point or on my subject detected eye. Think manual focus subject detection. All of a sudden, boom, the eye jumps to the center of my frame. Without me even moving a focus point, it sees the eye. I hit the OK button, boom, zooms in on that eye and I can manually focus it perfectly. So the OK button, I changed from resetting the focus point to being zoomed to 100%. I don't change the wheels, the command wheels. I change the movie record button. This is in still mode. I choose the move, change the movie record button to control ISO. Why do I do that? I've got an ISO dial. Well, what that enables me to do is when I flip the ISO dial to lock into the command wheel setting, C, there's a C on the ISO dial. And the ISO wheel moves around no problem until you put it into C and then it locks in and you have to push the button to release it. When it's in C, I want that movie record button to enable me to change the ISO with the back command dial and to change whether auto ISO is turned on or turned off with the front command dial. So that makes it so I don't have to jump into the menu to set the ISO when I'm in command mode dial. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, so, oops, I hit play <laughs> instead of the menu button. All right, so let's go into controls, back in where we were. So that's the only things I really, well, I changed, I changed the uh, lens function two button to be autofocus on. That's for longer lenses that have a second autofocus button. I can hit autofocus with my thumb. Sometimes I do that when I'm shooting a long lens. I can autofocus with my left hand on the lens. I set the other lens function button to be depth of field preview. Why do I do that? Depth of field preview, Nikon, all of their Z cameras do not stop down in live view past f5.6. They'll give you a live view of the aperture's effect on your image up to f5.6. Beyond f5.6, say you go to f11 or f16 and you want to shoot a sun star frame, you have to push the depth of field preview button to make the iris stop down and see the effect of final aperture on your image. And so, I love to shoot sun stars with my 24 to 120. It has a lens function button. If I hit that lens function button, I can see what the sun star looks like before I fire the frame at f16. That's why I put it there. Otherwise, I leave everything at default. The focus ring is focused in the right directions, and a focus recall button, if you have one, locks uh, the focus into, into, into position. So custom controls for playback, I don't really change them. I just don't. I mean, you can, you can run around and change them if you want. It gives you the ability to change all those functions when you're, when you're in playback mode. I haven't found a good reason to change them. Um, the touch functionality, this is cool. This is another first for Nikon cameras, but it's something that Canon and Sony have done for a long time. And I like seeing this pop up in the ZF, and I hope it's in all future Nikons. You are able to, uh, Turn this function on with just pressing the OK button here, turning it on, and you can assign what the touch screen does while you're looking through the viewfinder. So the screen's all dark, you're looking through the viewfinder composing, and yet touching the, 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 
the back LCD can do things. It can switch the eyes, it can move the focus point, it can turn a grid on and off, zoom in and out, turn the virtual horizon on. Switching eyes and moving the focus point are the two that make sense to me, and I like it to move the focus point around. And like Canon, uh, Sony also lets you define what area of the LCD is active. So when you're shooting horizontally, like landscape orientation, it can be the right half of the screen. When you're shooting vertically, like landscape, like like portrait orientation, I still want it to be that I want it to be the top half of the screen because my thumb is coming down to do it. So in, instead of it being the entire screen, it's kind of like a mouse pad to run your focus point around with your thumb just dragging on the touch screen. Make it just that side that your thumb can reach really easily without taking your hand off the, the grip and the shutter button. Cool stuff. Focus point lock. Uh, this would just lock your focus point position. It doesn't have an actual switch like some cameras, but you can do it with a button here. I've never done it, but you could. Reverse dial rotation, don't want to do that personally, but some people might. Uh, release the button to use the dial. A lot of people love this. I don't. For functions where you have to hold the button down to change a setting, um, this lets you just push the button, change the setting, push the button again to deactivate it. Uh, it feels like three button presses instead of one to me, but you know, or two button presses, it's slower for me. Reverse indicators of exposure when you're working with exposure. I like underexposed on the left, overexposed on the right. Some people want the opposite, I suppose. Reverse the ring for focus. You know, if it seems off to you, you can. It's not going to work with a manual focus lens like this, but some of the focus by wire lenses. Um, control ring response. If you're working with the control ring, say to set exposure compensation or something like that. You can make it high or low so that turning it a little bit does a lot or a little bit doesn't do very much. Um, switch focus and control ring ro mode rolls. That's the only, that's only gonna be active when you have a lens capable of it. I've never done that, you could. Um, zoom, power zoom button functions. If you have a powered zoom lens, I've never worked with a powered zoom lens on Nikon, but if you did, you could set different buttons to control it. Um, full frame playback flip. So while you're in playback mode, you can turn it so that with flicking up and flicking down, do things like star ratings or record a voice memo, as opposed to which way as you flick does, does, it, does it change the image? You can flick to the next image like you would on a phone. I do do that, and I leave it at left and right, you know, just sort of left to right. You can choose your own way. Um, now, we've got video mode. If you change the eye menu just like you would in still mode, I'm not going to go into depth on that. I'm just going to show you what I have in my video eye menu. It's different in video mode than it is in still mode. I have picture control in the top row, then white balance, then image quality and frame size, that's that 10 bit, you know, H265, um, or frame size and frame rate. Actually, that's the, that's the 4K 24 frame per second setting. What's the microphone sensitivity if you're working with the on-camera mic? Uh, what's the image area you're shooting? DX, full frame, autofocus mode or manual focus mode, um, your subject Air detection and autofocus area mode if you're working in autofocus. Airplane mode, just to shut everything down so nothing's interrupted while you're shooting video. Wind noise reduction on and off. Uh, customize your controls, because you might suddenly want some slightly different controls while you're shooting video. Vibration reduction, turning it on and off. And electronic vibration reduction, turning it on and off. All those are easily accessible while shooting video by putting them in there. Custom controls, I just really mostly mirror what's going on with my stills mode. So the function button, I have live information, information, live information display off. And what that means is it just goes to nothing but the image, nothing at all. No focus point, no horizon, no histogram, nothing at all. That's all, I, I just wanna see the image as I'm shooting video sometimes. Um, and that's just a touch of that button, touch of the button brings it back. Um, the auto exposure and, and auto focus lock button becomes back button focus, just like it would with stills. Um, my display, but I have play and display switch just like I do on the camera. I'll undo that for my settings file. If you want to put the play button on the right where your thumb can access it, just switch these right here. Um, 
OK resets the focus point. I don't need to zoom into 100% in video as much. I can use the magnification buttons. If you wanted to, you could change that. This is how it is stock on stills, too. You could say zoom on and off to 100%. That's how you set that. Oops, let's go back to custom controls. Now, I have the shutter button be the movie record button. And I still have the movie record button do ISO control when it's in the command dial mode. So that's a major change from stock. By stock, the shutter button does nothing, and the movie record button starts and stops movie recording. Instead, I change that to where the shutter button both takes stills and records video if you're in video mode. And the movie record button is your ISO button no matter what. The command dials I don't change. The lens function button I have switch eyes. I don't need depth of field preview in video because it automatically stops down and gives me depth of field preview at every aperture in video mode, which is proof that they could do that in still mode if they wanted to for us, especially in manual focus mode. But in video mode, uh, I don't need it, so I set switch eyes. If I'm doing eye detect, I can switch which eye is the one that's selected. Now, the lens function 2 is still autofocus on, and the focus and memory are all stock settings. Um, focus ring and memory recall are stock settings. Focus point lock, leave the same thing with stills. You could lock your focus point. Limit your area mode selection. Autofocus speed. How fast is the camera autofocusing? I leave it at the stock setting, but you might want it to change its focus slower or faster, depending on a cinematic desire for how it looks. Autofocus tracking sensitivity. Again, this is, you know, how sticky is the autofocus tracking? Is it slow or is it fat? Is it, is it high sensitivity or low sensitivity? Power zoom, power zoom button options, again, for power zoom lenses, which I don't generally use with the Nikon Z bodies. Fine ISO control. Um, that lets you go to more than a third of a stop, to a sixth of a stop for video. Sometimes that can be good. Extended shutter speeds, uh, that is different than it is for still mode. Uh, in video mode, what that means is you can do shutter speeds slower than your frame rate. I don't understand how they do it, or up to your frame rate. Um, I, don't, I don't turn that on. I don't need that. View assist, um, that's just essentially whether or not you're seeing zebras and like these little bars moving when you have overexposed or close to overexposed portions of your frame. You can choose what that pattern is. I like it to be only showing in high, um, the, the highlights of the image. This is the choice of pattern, the zebra stripe. I want the threshold to be 250. It's on a scale of 255. So as I approach pure white blown out highlights, it's gonna start giving me zebra stripes a little bit before to warn me. Um, and you can set that where you want. I don't usually work with them in the mid-tone range, so I just leave that at default. You can limit the zebra tone pattern to the highlights. That's what I want. Um, the grid type in video, I like that rule of thirds grid. Um, the brightness information display. Is it a waveform monitor or a histogram? Video shooters, and I've grown to join them, like a waveform. I don't need it large over the center of my frame. I want it low profile, not interrupting my view of this image. But it's a different way to view tone in video as it flows through. Waveforms are really nice for video shooters. You can still use a traditional histogram if you want. Custom monitor shooting display. This is the same thing we did with stills. I have been basically no information except the focus point. It's very, very similar. Um, I have three chosen. Same thing with viewfinder, really, really similar. You can see, you can go in and set up what you want in there or not. Um, Red record frame indicator. Yes, I love this. This is the same in the Z8 and the Z9. In the Z30, by the way, you get this red. Actually, no, just the Z8 and the Z9 and the ZF. So it's the third camera with it. It gives you a big red box around your uh, monitor when it's recording. So you can tell there's like a big square box around it. Yes, I am recording. I know I'm recording. It might annoy some people, not me. And that ends our custom settings. Playback menu. I don't change a lot. You can delete images in here. You know, either all the images are selected pictures or ones that you choose. The playback folder, what folder are you playing back from? All or just individual folders on your card. Playback display options. Um, these are important. You know, I turn off everything except RGB histogram, uh, the picture only, and basic shooting data 
uh, things that are included in basic that, that are in the detailed shooting view. You can I just have basic data and flash data, nothing else. Oh, and IPTC data. But again, the only things I want to see when I'm going into playback mode are none, RGB histogram, and then that, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I hit the display button, which for me is playback, and as I look through the different modes, I have information, my basic information. I have the histogram, the tri-colored histogram, what happened in the red, green, and blue channel in a composite of them, along with some exposure data, and nothing at all. So that's what we're talking about here. Delete pictures from both slots. That's only activated if you're using um, the backup mode with the, with the SD card and the micro SD card. If you delete a picture from one, it deletes it from both. Dual format recording um, playback slot. So if you do record to both, are you playing back from the micro SD slot or the SD slot? I don't know why you'd choose the micro, you're playing back from the SD slot. Filtered playback criteria, you can go in and change some filters to only see those images when you're in playback. Um, series playback, this is when you shoot burst modes. Do you want it to automatically play every frame in the burst or do you want to see it as a series, as a single thumbnail? and then you can press the OK button to delve in and look at the individual frames in the series. That way, if you shoot 300 frames in that C30 mode, do you need to go through every single one of them to get to the next series? No. And so that's handy. Picture review, um, that's where, if you take a picture, does it then interrupt your shooting to show you what you just shot? I like that turned off. After delete, I love this, continue as before. So if you're going backwards through your images and you delete an image, it goes to the next one that you haven't looked at already. Right? Either direction you're going, it continues in that direction. Um, after burst, show, you want the first picture in the burst that you shot or the last picture in the burst that you shot? I don't know. It's totally depend scene dependent. So I think generally first picture in burst, I'm going to set it at that. Auto-rotate pictures, I really don't like auto-rotating pictures. I can turn the camera if I need to. The problem with auto-rotating pictures is you see vertical frames really small with huge amounts of letterboxing left and right, and you don't see the detail in the frame without zooming in. Copy images, you can move them around. Setup menu, we're going to run fast. You can format your memory card here. You can choose what language, time zone, and date. I generally just connect to my Nikon SnapBridge app on my smartphone and have it synchronize the time with my phone. That way, if I connect when I land somewhere on the other side of the globe, my phone connects to the network, I connect the camera to the phone, the phone updates the camera automatically. Monitor brightness, you can go in and tweak that. I have mine at plus two. Certain situations, I want to turn it down, turn it up. Monitor color balance, you can change and tweak your color balance. Your viewfinder brightness luckily has an automatic mode. I leave it there. Uh, you can change, tweak its color. Um, finder display size, standard or small? Small is for those who use glasses and have a hard time seeing all the way through the inside of the viewfinder. I use standard since I generally shoot with my diopter adjusted for my eye. Limit monitor mode selection. You can go in and limit the monitor modes. Um, I don't do that. Auto rotate information display. So this is when you're shooting, when you flip it up, does it all of a sudden your shutter speed and aperture and all everything flip the, 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 the level and everything in vertical mode to be vertically displayed and then flip back and you go horizontally displayed. That's a newer thing with Nikons, I love it. Fine tuning autofocus. This is something that was more useful in the days of the F mount lenses. And I would only really fine tune F mount lenses. I've tested um, using different, different lens calibration software, a bunch of different Nikon Z lenses and never found any of them more than plus one, minus one on a scale to 20 that off, which I think is in the margin of error. I think the fact that it's focusing on the sensor and, and, and focusing the lens so that the image on the sensor is as sharp as possible kind of diff, it just, just does away with the need to calibrate a rangefinder system like the F cameras had. It's just a more accurate focusing system in the Z world. Non-CPU lens data. So when I use an old lens that's not chipped, this white lantern manual focus lens is chipped. The camera knows what aperture it's at. It knows what lens it is. It's got lens corrections built into it. An old lens like this 30-year-old 105 2.5 AIS lens, maybe it's even more than 30 years old, it doesn't give any electronic data to the camera. So I have to tell the camera what lens is on it so that it records exposure information correctly and meters correctly. 
So that's my number one lens. That's the only one I really use. And I have set the, ap the focal length at 105 and the maximum aperture at 2.5. If I was going to use another lens, I would go in and create lens 2's data. Right now it's blank. Lens 2, there is no lens 2. Oh, I just changed lens 1. Ah, let's go back to 2.5. That's how you do it. All right, save focus position. This is one I like to put in my menu. This is handy. When it's turned on and you turn the camera off and turn it back on, it'll remember right where a new modern focus by wire Nikon Z lens was focused, and it'll put you right back to where you were last focused. When it's turned off, it's also handy, because what happens is when you turn the camera and turn it back on, it focuses that lens to infinity, and it's really pretty precise. It works great. Great. Try it night shooting with stars. You'll find, ooh, my stars are in focus. When this is turned off, I turn the camera off and back on, focuses at infinity. Save the zoom position for power zoom lenses. Again, I've never used a power zoom lens on a Z camera, so it could be cool. Auto temperature control cutout. So this is if the camera gets hot, which I haven't had happen with this camera, even recording a bunch of video. Um, if it got hot, maybe I haven't shot in hot enough conditions. You can tell it to not shut off unless it gets really hot, or you can leave it at its standard setting. And of course, you know, it'll tell you all about that. So going back, clean the image sensor. You can tell it to just do uh, cleaning right now if you hold the camera upside down and let it shake dust off the sensor before you go to blow the sensor off. You can also set it so that it automatically does that every time it shuts off. Clean at shutdown. Boom. You can create a dust off reference photo for a really clean sensor. What should it look like? Um, you can do pixel mapping. If there, it'll find out if there's dead pixels. If you find consistent dead pixels, which sometimes happens as cameras age, you can map it and it'll automatically eliminate those dead pixels. You can uh, attach image comments. Uh, you can add your copyright information. I have it in here right now that I'm the artist and all rights are reserved to my images. That's appended to the metadata. I'll eliminate that before I put out my setup file for you guys to download and apply if you want to. Uh, you can go in and, and tweak your IPTC data. We're not going to talk about that. That's just metadata stuff. Voice memo options. Do you have to hold the button down or not? What's the audio output level when you listen to them? Camera sounds. I don't really use voice memos, but you know I see why some people might in scientific applications and things. Camera sounds. I leave it off. You can change the, the volume and all that kind of stuff. Silent mode is off. I put that, as you saw, in the I menu, easy to get to. Touch controls are on, so we can touch the screen to do things. Self-portrait mode is off. When you're in self-portrait mode, if you flip the, the monitor out so that you can see it from the front of the camera, say you were doing a YouTube video or something, then it locks all the controls. And so I find that super annoying. I, I don't turn that on. Um, HDMI. Just controls for how data is output through HDMI. Um, USB connection priority, these are just some, some settings and things. Conformity marking is, you know, these are things that you don't really need to delve into too much. USB power delivery, that's important. I don't know why you'd ever turn that off, but what that enables is when you plug a USB-C cable into this camera with, say, a power delivery capable battery bank like I recommend in my review video, it can power, it can charge the camera's battery while you're working with the camera at the same time. Uh, it enables you to charge the battery through the USB-C port. Energy saving mode, if you're really trying to sip battery, you could run in here and turn that on. I generally leave it off for highest performance possibilities. Empty slot release, I don't know why this isn't always on by default, but I like to lock it so that it can't pretend it's shooting photos when there's no memory card in it. I always find that really annoying when that's turned to be able to enable it to fake shooting photos to nothing. Save and load menu settings, critical. Constantly be using this. Get your menu set up the way you want it. Save it to your memory card as a backup. All right, just remember when you format your card, you're gonna wipe that out, so then resave it again. Um, you know, just keep constantly saving it as you tweak and adjust your settings. If you format your card, you know, load the, mem the menu settings that you like onto, onto, the, onto the camera so that it's set up how you like it. Format the card, save it again to the card. Reset all settings, that's a factory reset. Firmware version, this is where you go to update your firmware when there's new firmware on your memory card, or you can do it through your SnapBridge app via Bluetooth on your phone. It's also where you show what firmware version's on it right now. And that's the end of the setup menu. We're almost there. So your network menu, all right? Uh, network menu has airplane mode, turning that on and off. You can connect to your smart device, so for SnapBridge, 
It's got a wireless remote control that you can connect to. It's sort of annoying. Right now I'm connected to my wireless remote control via Bluetooth. If I want to connect to my phone, it'll disconnect me from my remote control. I really wish they'd put two-channel Bluetooth in this. That's one of my gripes in my review video. But you can choose which one you're connected to. Connect to the computer, connect to an FTP server, connect to other cameras, connect to an Atomos uh, dis, you know, uh, display controller, USB connections. These are all kind of advanced connectivity capabilities that this camera has that it shares with the Z9 and the Z8, which is pretty cool. And then you've got the all-important My Menu. And this is where you put things that you couldn't quite get squeezed into the iMenu. Maybe they're not quite important enough to warrant being in the iMenu, but you want access to them without searching through all the menus to find out where was power off delay, for example. So the way you, you, you control this, you can get rid of something like airplane mode. Let's say we want to remove it. I can go remove items, remove airplane mode, delete. Okay, I just re removing that from my My Menu, all right? Now I wanna add an item, I wanna add airplane mode. So I'm gonna go into my network menu, airplane mode, add it, and then I can choose where I'm putting it, the little yellow line. I'm gonna put it right at the top, boom, all right? So now if I go to the top of my menu, airplane mode is there. If I wanna move something around in here, that's rank. I can go in here and I could move, I could say select airplane mode, move it to here. Select airplane mode, move it back. All right, so that's how you control what's in my menu. In the my menu, I'm gonna show you what I have selected that's important to me. All right, here we go. I got airplane mode at the top, save and load menu settings, and format memory card. To me, those are related. Anytime I'm going to format my memory card, I load my settings, format my memory card, save my settings, so they're always there. Pixel shift shooting, I want to be able to turn that on easily just by hitting my menu, boom, I'm in pixel shift shooting. I can activate it choose its settings, focus peaking, do I want to turn that on and off, wireless remote control options, uh, sometimes I change the options on my little wireless remote control, starlight view for night shooting, warm display colors, those go side by side just like they are in the menu, custom controls, so I can change the custom button if I want for different situations, custom controls for video, if I want to change the custom controls and custom buttons for video, autofocus activation, um, is, is that uh, going to be on the back button or not? And why I put that in my menu, sometimes I hand the camera to somebody who's used to AF being on the shutter button and I don't want to have to teach them how to use back button focus. I just flip, if I want someone to take my photo, and I know they don't know about back button focus, I can flip it to shutter button focus. Manual focus subject detection area. So do I want it to be auto area, wide area, large, or wide area, small? when I'm doing manual focus and having it select subjects, connect to subjects. Connect to smart device, so connect to my smartphone to download images or just to set, set the time up. Image quality, do I want to shoot a RAW or do I want to shoot a JPEG? I don't know, I, I never really changed that from RAW so I could probably get rid of it. Save focus position, that's that. Do I want it to focus at infinity when I turn it off and on or do I want it to focus right where I was last? Pre-release capture options. Turn on the pre-release capture for that 30 frame a second JPEG mode. Do I want it to capture the half a second before I press the shutter all the way down, or a whole second, or a third of a second? Flash control, if I'm working with a flash, I can get into that flash control. Monitor brightness, do I want to change the monitor brightness from where it is? USB connection priority, photo flicker reduction. Those are my, my menu settings, all right? That's all of them. I have filled it with the maximum number possible. That's why add is grayed out right now. And I'm gonna tell you, it's really important to me to have the right things in the iMenu and in the My Menu for this camera. So, as I said, I'm gonna put out the setup file. You can download it. I'm gonna put a link to it. You can click right here to go over and download that setup file, which you can put on your memory card and load my menu settings that I've gone through in this video. But I hope that you go through this video and you really understand what each one is. The key to everything I've changed is in this video. And you know, the other thing I would say, you know, the, the only things I'm going to tweak that aren't in my settings is switching the display button and the play button. I think that'll throw people for a little bit of a loop. Um, so if you want to do that too, if you want to make the play button be on the right where your thumb can easily access it without moving your hand off the lens, just switch the display and the play button in the custom settings. Um, 
in the control section of custom settings, shooting controls. Um, and I'm also going to get rid of my copyright information, but I showed you where to go in and add that to the metadata for yourself. So I know this has been a long video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gives you a little bit more of a window into how this retro style but technologically wildly advanced camera operates. And, you know, I don't expect you to use all the settings exactly the same as mine, but I hope that you understand what those settings do a little bit more and that you'll delve in and adopt some of my settings and discard some of my settings based on your own use case. So if you have questions or comments, don't, you know, don't hesitate to email me or drop comments in this video. Um, thanks again for watching it. Uh, I do videos every single Thursday, approaching the same videos about all things photographic and subscribing, liking, sharing this content really drives my channel. So I appreciate you're all doing that. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. 